This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is former Memphis Tigers great and Memphis Grizzlies minority owner, Elliot Perry. Simply put, Elliot Perry is a Memphis treasure. Let's forget for a second he is the second all-time leading scorer at the University of Memphis, then Memphis State, and is part of the impressive list of minority owners of the Memphis Grizzlies. Let's forget he had a very impressive decade-long run in the NBA and now is a member of the Grizzlies radio broadcast team and also was instrumental in creating the Grizzlies Foundation, which provides mentorship opportunities for Memphis youth. He also serves on the board. Let's forget he is a terrific father, husband, civic leader, champion of causes, and friend. Let's forget about all of that for a second. And you know what we still come up with? That Elliot Perry is just a nice guy. But luckily for us, he's all the things I mentioned, and then some. Today, I hit the court with a proud Memphian, a former skinny kid from Treadwell High School who eventually made it fashionable to wear socks up to your knees. Elliot Perry joins me next on Sports Files. Elliot, always great to see you. Thanks so much for being with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Big trade that the Grizzlies made in dealing Rudy Gay and, of course, other players that were dealt and other players that were brought in. Your thoughts when that first happened and, and now your thoughts about 10 games since the trade. You know, I think it's always hard when you make a trade, in particular with one of your star players, uh, a guy who's been really kind of the anchor of your franchise. And when you look at that core group of young guys, he was a part of that core group. And so um, it's always hard when you make that move. But that's what I consider the ugly side of basketball that, you know, fans don't want to see, fans don't want to hear about. Uh, but I think having made that trade, uh, it gives you a lot of things that you can do. One, from a fiscal standpoint, I mean, obviously being fiscally responsible is important to any basketball team, but also I think it didn't allow us to destitute our, our team. When you start mm -hmm. to look at, we still have our core guys together. You bring in a guy like Tayshaun Prince with his pedigree, a guy who's won titles, who, who's won a title before. Uh, and more importantly, I think his style of play fits Lionel's system. Uh, and Rudy Gay, very gifted young man, I think he'll do well in Toronto. You have to look at it now through a, a couple of different glasses. One, as a former player, as a fan of the Grizzlies, as part of the broadcasting team, but now also as a part of the minority ownership team, as you bought a nice stake in this team. So when you look at things, you got to look at it in a couple different angles, don't you? Well, I think it's been a learning experience for me, uh, obviously being around Jason and those guys and, and, and really realizing and hearing more about their vision and how proactive they've been uh, in the short time they've been with the team. So that's in, in, inspiring to me. Uh, but also, I'm still a fan of the game. I still look at it from the lens of a basketball player. You know, when I talk about things on the air, on the radio, again, I'm looking at them from as if I was playing the game. And so, exactly. Uh, it, it's, it's been very rewarding. We had some sad news recently about Michael Heisley. Mm -hmm. And as we tape this program, uh, not, in, not in great shape after the stroke and, and the coma. And here's a guy who um, he told it like it was. I mean, he would come on my radio show, and I know he would talk to you. Yeah. and. You know, what you saw is what you got. Yeah. And uh, certainly saddened to hear that news for Agnes's wife and that entire Heisley family. We certainly send out our thoughts and prayers. Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, I, I tweeted about it uh, yesterday after hearing the news um, and just uh, wish him a speedy recovery. You know, more importantly, he was here, a great owner. Um, he was very honest to the people about what he was going to do. Uh, in terms of when he broke the team down, you know, when, I, even I'll back up, even one when he built the team right. uh, with, with, with Hubie Brown, that team he built, mm -hmm. broke the team back down and then ultimately built uh, another playoff contending team. And so uh, he was a phenomenal owner. You and I have had a chance to broadcast Tigers games together, yeah. but you do now an awful lot of Grizzlies games on the radio mm -hmm. with, with Eric Castletine. How much do you like broadcasting? I love it. Uh, it, because really, if you think about it, Greg, you, you're going to be 
at the games anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and then being able to talk the game uh, through. I mean, Eric Hasseltine does a great job of, of really putting me at ease, uh, much like you did on, on TV. Uh, but, you know, being able to look at different coaches' philosophy and the way they teach, uh, being able to look at different game plans, both offensively and defensively, mm -hmm. and then thinking about, you know, how would you approach that, you know, again, as a as a basketball player, one, as a point guard and understanding personnel, uh, understanding when to get guys the ball, when not to get guys the ball, uh, what plays to run, looking at the clock scenario, but then also looking at it just for, out of the eyes of a coach, too. Off the court, you're still involved with the Grizzlies, with the Grizzlies Foundation, which you helped found. You're a board member. Talk about how important that is to you. You know, I think that's for me has been one of the big rewards. I mean, when you think about being able to use a franchise's name um, to be able to use that as the platform to elevate, uh, you know, social causes. Right. Uh, you know, we've hung our hat on mentoring for the last uh, four years. Uh, we're in a number of schools right now. We partner with a number of organizations. Um, but, you know, just being able to put a responsible person in a young person's life, that's a part of changing life. And we also see that as, a, as an extension of education, too. You know, I think about, you know, my own personal experience. It was a mentor who really... Uh, helped shape and mold my life, gave me the confidence in myself uh, that, you know, anything you want to do, and I know we hear that a lot, you can right. do it, but that was not just a cliche. I mean, Michael Tony really, really uh, engaged me, you know, one, with my education, but two, that you, know, you can be a good basketball player if you just put the time in. And uh, I mean, he put the time in with me both uh, educationally and um, on the court. Well, you've proven it. I mean, the, the proof is in the pudding with whatever you do. The Grizzlies, as a broadcaster, as a part owner, the foundation. But also, there's still the great ties with the University of Memphis, oh, no where you're the second all-time leading scorer. What's your greatest memory, individually, on the court, from your days with the Tigers? Uh, just the great relationships we, we built. I mean, not, not just me personally. I think we, we, when you look at that Coliseum experience, that was a family experience. My mom, she still talks about all the relationships she built. Uh, all my teammates were, were great teammates, but uh, I think what was most rewarding for me was, was the relationship I had with Coach Finch. Mm -hmm. um, really was like a, a father figure to me. Uh, he was always uh, pushing me to be, be my best, and that was not just uh, as a basketball player. That was as a person as well. He, he had a saying that it, it's hard, but it's fair, uh, and it was. You know, not only Coach Finch, but, but Coach Luz did a great job of holding us accountable. And really, Coach Sims really, really pushed us. I mean, I don't know if the guys remember Dorsey Sims, but he, mm -hmm. assistant coach, I mean, held us accountable in the classroom to the utmost. And I think when you look back at, you know, what happened during that time and the graduation ratio that, that Coach Finch had, particularly uh, in my era, I mean, most of those guys have gone, gone on to do great things. Elliot, who was the best player you played with? and against in college, and then I'll ask you about the NBA. In college, I probably would say my freshman year, um, Sylvester Gray, my freshman year. Okay, Sylvester Gray with, Sly now Gray. against? Against, to Played me, against a lot it of would great have players. To, to me in that Metro Conference, well, I, I, I take two players. Okay. Uh, Bimbo Coles was always well, he could shoot. a monster, but Gary Payton. Uh, probably the second the guy. glove. NBA, best, and you, you made a number of stops, 10-year NBA career, best player you ever played with and against? With Charles Barkley, hands down. I mean, no question about it. Uh, I consider uh, Jason Kidd a close second, but um, played, I mean, played with, uh, played against, wow. Uh, met up with MJ, I right? go with, well, I didn't have to guard him. Right, but, right. Yeah, I mean, clearly <laughs> MJ would be it, but I would say point guard. Maybe like Tim Hardaway. Tim Hardaway. By the way, is Barkley the same cut up as he is now? Oh, no question about it. No, he hasn't the, changed. The, the plane, never a dull moment on the plane. You made some fashion statements in your days. I've got, of course, the nickname Socks. Yeah. You would wear the socks. By the way, when I was a kid, many moons ago, not much of a fashion statement from me, but yeah. I would wear the socks up to well, my knee that, as well. That was old school. It, you were old school. We did that in, in the 70s, so you were wearing that. I don't know how many other players were, but... You'll be remembered for that. And then at the time, you had the goggles on as well. So what about being a, 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 making a fashion statement? Well, I don't know how much of a fashion statement the goggles, <laughs> the goggles were. Uh, uh, that was just a, uh, I needed to see. And uh, my, right. mom, my mom in high school got tired of, me, tired of me playing in my glasses and breaking my glasses. So we were able to get those goggles, and the rest is history. Uh, but the, the funny story about the, the socks, 
situation. I mean, I used to wear my socks down like everybody else, and, and we played in a, a Christmas tournament at the University of Me at Memphis State at the time right. uh, in New York um, my, my freshman year. And, you know, Coach Finch, he would always talk on the board. And as he was talking, I, I always took that time to put my shoes on, put my socks on, you know, just take my time just as a routine. And, and that day I would pull my socks all the way up and then fold them down. Mm -hmm. and I didn't do it that time because we were, we were pressed against the clock. <laughs> Went out, had a good game against Rick Smith at Maris. And uh, the rest is history. I just left my socks up. Was he the dunking Dutchman, I dunking think they, Dutchman. they called him. So yeah. the, rest, the, the rest is history. How much do you like this Tigers team that you're seeing this mm -hmm. year? Fantastic. I think they're playing, um, they're playing together. And, and I consider it, w when a lot of people talk about just kind of the competition, but they have the ingredients of a winning basketball team. And what I mean by that is, you know, they're moving the basketball. They're not worried about who's, who's getting the points. I think they genuinely like each other. I agree. Um, I think they, they're having fun. Uh, it's not a grind. Um, and, and they're just going out and playing basketball, and I think that's the ingredients of a winning team. Uh, I think if you take, took this team right now and take them back at the beginning of the season, um, I think they can beat Minnesota. I think they'll, they'll, they, they could. They would have fared they, better. Yeah, they would have fared better. Give me about 30 seconds on this tremendous art collection I've heard a lot about that you have. Uh, I've been collecting since 97 and wow. um, you know, started collecting a lot of the Harlem Renaissance artists. Uh, when I initially started collecting Jacob Lawrence, Elizabeth Catlett, Norman Lewis, a lot of those uh, older, older, older artists, and then wow. uh, the last uh, seven years or so, I've just only been collecting living contemporary artists, so uh, young artists who are reflecting the times uh, that we live in now uh, through visual art. So it's been fantastic building relationships with every artist in my collection. Have you ever had it appraised? Uh, I, I haven't lately. You may, you may not want it to divulge. Yeah, I, ha <laughs> I haven't lately. Yeah. But that's something uh, to behold, I'm sure. All right, Elliot, you're off the hot seat, but now we have five for the road. So five questions, quick answers, first thing that comes to mind. This first one's interesting. Your favorite professional team, but you can't say any of the teams you played for. Mm -hmm, yeah. And you can't say the team you are part owner of. So who would it be? And it could be any sport. Uh, I would say the Chicago Bears. Chicago Bears? Yeah, no doubt about it. Okay. Yeah, the Bears. Um, favorite all-time athlete? That's a, that's a good one. Who was the, the, the guy you emulated as a kid? Did you have posters of anybody? Um, I mean, the guys that I emulated were like Maurice Cheeks. I mean, those, those were the guys who I, I really liked as, mm -hmm. as basketball players. But, the, you know, the guy I think, uh, I, I mean, I love Walter Payton. I sure. met, him, met him when I was in high school. That's why I'm a Bears fan. Favorite music? Favorite music, wow. Musician? Uh, I, love, I love Nina Simone. Nina Simone? Nina Simone. What's, what style? Is she, uh, is she blues? Kind of a bluesy, jazzy, you know, old school, but she was very, very uh, social conscious. That, that makes sense for you. Yeah. It doesn't you know, easy go. And yeah. I, I would have been surprised if you said Nirvana or something no, like that, headbanging. No. Um, favorite movie of all time? Wow. Got to be one that stands tell you out, right? Movie that I, I love is uh, um, Malcolm X. Malcolm X with yeah. Denzel Washington. Yeah, with Denzel Washington. Is there a sports yeah. movie? Just real quick. Oh, Rudy. Rudy. Yeah. Okay. Inspiring. It is. Yeah. I mean, you're a little guy, right? Making it big, huh? Rudy. I, I can see all that heart. inspiration. All heart. All right. Finally, favorite television show of all time? I'll be honest with you. Sanford and Son. I can watch it over and over and over. My dad and I used to watch Sanford and Son, and it would be followed by, I think it was Chico and the Man. I don't Chico know if you saw the, the reruns or not, but you remember the, the first run? Yeah, I remember Chico Sanford and the Man. Sanford and Son and yeah. Red Fox. Great stuff. Yeah. Elliot, always a pleasure. Continued success. We'll talk to you down the road. Thanks, Thank Elliot Perry. We'll take a quick break, come back with overtime right after this. When it comes to round ball in the city of Memphis, there's the Tigers and the Grizzlies and tons of high school basketball. A little something for everyone. But as most hoop junkies know, the city also has some terrific smaller basketball programs that in their own right have produced some memorable moments over the years. 
One of those programs is Division II Christian Brothers University. Mike Niedaber is in his 14th season as Bucks head coach, and he's a good one, a real good one. Entering this season, Nee Neighbors teams have produced over 100 wins the past five seasons, including a Gulf South Conference championship, two Western Division titles, and a South Regional Championship. They also made the Elite Eight in 2009 and the Sweet 16 last season. In addition, Nee Neighbor won an NABC South Region Coach of the Year award and picked up two Gulf South West Coach of the Year honors. This season, the Bucks have battled numerous injuries, yet stand in second place entering the last week of the regular season. Recently, I had a chance to catch up with one of the best-kept coaching secrets in the country, Mike Neenaver. Mike, 14 years now at Christian Brothers University, so much success. Why has it worked? Well, I, I think in general, um, I think it's, it, I've been, it's been a good fit for me. I, I went to a Christian Brothers high school in Cincinnati growing up, um, you know, and, and I, I just think I've always felt comfortable. Of course, you, we had talked earlier, I was at Bethel, in McKenzie, Tennessee for 16 years before that. And, and during that time, we were in the same NAI league, back the old Tennessee, the old VSAC and Trans South. And it was funny, I, when we came down here to play, when I was coaching against CBU, it always felt like, I always felt comfortable here. There was always a brother or two that I had in high school that would come up and holler at me, you know. And so, I, so it always felt like kind of a second home for me when I came down here and played. And ironically, it worked out where I came in. You're able to find the players, whether it be in your native Cincinnati, whether it be here in Memphis, that, that fit your style. Talk about your style. I know it's different, and you've had that success with it. Why does that work? Well, we, we went to it. You know, I mean, I, I've been coaching similar kids, and you know, even before we went to the Princeton style stuff, we, we've been doing that probably about seven or eight years now. And actually, we made the move off of one of our most successful years back in the, the Clint Dattle era, those guys that really right. helped turn the program around in the early years. And, and you know, that's one of the things I have to say about the success we've had. And we've been really fortunate. And we have been, and I, and I would even go so far as to say lucky. And some of the kids that we've gotten from, you know, going back to Clint Dattle era and some of those guys, because at this level, you've got to find guys that the big guys miss on. Sure. You got to get a break because if they're if you don't have guys that are good enough to play at the next level, you're not going to win at this level. You know, I, I think if you're a successful D3 program, you talk about and we've had several All-Americans um, and you know more than you can count All-Conference players. Those guys could all play Division One, and I would say our, you know in our D, in our first team guys like guys like Nick Coase and Scott Dennis last year and Zach Warner. Those guys could play for half the D1 schools in the country, so you got to get you got to get some breaks on that. You got to see things in them when they come in, um, because if, if any if any D1 had tried to recruit them, then we would we wouldn't have got you know. So it, so we've been fortunate on that, and, and you know, and, and my connection in Cincinnati. Obviously, I know a lot of those high school coaches. I was recruiting up there for the 16 years I was at Bethel, so we we have been really fortunate. Nice connection up there. Yes. You've had three of your teams make the NCAA Division II tournament. You've had a plethora of success in the Gulf South Conference. Last year, you were in the NCAA tournament. This year, you're right there. You're battling. But, boy, right. it's been an uphill battle with injuries. Has it's, this been the, the toughest coaching season for you? It, in many ways, I would say it's right up there. We had, I, I think, one thing that's helped our team this year, we had the same thing in some ways and maybe even more extreme happen to us two years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing that's really frustrating is we've, we've been, you know, been fortunate to get into three NCAA tournaments in the years I've been here, but I can look back on at least three other years that we were right there and injuries and different things, you know, went against us. And uh, two years ago when, uh, when Scott Dennis and Zach Warner, who were our All-Americans last year that kind of led our team, when they were juniors, we were 15 and three and we were headed for the NCAA tournament that year. Right. And we lost them both within two games and had to finish that year. And a lot of our juniors and seniors this year are the guys that were freshmen and sophomores on that team. And I really think some of the experience, the experience that, you know, and we talked about We've it. We've learned from it. When we lost Harry, who, you know, going into the season, most people would have said was our, he was our first team all-conference preseason player. That's Harry Green from Harry White Green, Station White High School. Station, right. And when we lost Harry, I, all of us that lived through the season two years ago had a little flashback on that. But when we kind of sat down and said, look, you know, this is a devastating loss. 
but it's not the same level. And I said, for two reasons. That year we lost two all-conference players. You know, with Harry we lost probably one. Um, this year, and that year it fell on freshmen and sophomores. Those freshmen and sophomores that it fell on that year are juniors and seniors now. Mm -hmm. So they have responded. Uh, you know, we, we were going great. You know, we got a great win, you know, over North Alabama, looking back on it and hit ourselves in a position to really play for first place. And as that game ended, Corey McCarthy, who was one of those freshmen who stepped into the starting lineup two and a half years ago and has been in it ever since, or, you know, when, when Scott went down, we lost him on the last play of the game. So now, you know, we're playing without two of our two of our, our two starting guards. Uh, you know, a lot of people saw the Memphis game, and obviously, we you know it was a pretty good game, you know, pretty good representation for us and our program. Uh, the five guys that started that game have only started four games together all year. So it's been an uphill battle right. all season long. Trey Casey, who's a key player for us, has been hurt all year. Ryan Fleming, who and both Cincinnati LaSalle guys, where I went to high school, so I'm kind of kind of special special to me that way that they are my guys from my high school. They. Ryan was really going to be our sixth man, mm -hmm. and he has stepped in and started all but those four games, and has played really well, solid, and you know, so everybody stepped up. It, it says an awful lot. It says an awful lot about the depth and, and and what these young men know, what they how they have to right. pick up for their fallen comrades, right. if you will, and they, right. they've been able to do that. And you've had another very good season, and we'll see what happens in the end if you can do so and get back to the tournament with a depleted roster. You mentioned Memphis. Right. Every year you open up, you have the exhibition game right. with Memphis. There are some that certainly know Mike Neighbor. He's been around for a long time here in the city. But there are many that find out about you in that game. Right. And they see it each and every year. And you put on a great performance. Your guys are ready to go. And they always seem to give Memphis fits. How big is that game for you? Well, it's a big it, it means a lot to us because, you know, on one hand, we kind of tell our guys going in. It's obviously it's a practice game. You know, it's an exhibition. It doesn't count on our record. Uh, but obviously for our representation in Memphis. I can remember the year Clint Dattle had such a good game there. You know, people were coming up to me in February talking about the Memphis game. You know, they don't, they don't have any idea right. how we're doing in the league, whether we've <laughs> won another game since then. And in fact, that year, is, that senior year was one of our less successful, although we, were, we won, but it was, it was not a great year for us. And, you know, I'm, I'm running into people at high school games in January feeling maybe after losing a couple of games and people are still talking about that game. But we, you understand that. And, and, and it's, it's big for us. You know, obviously it's a big financial game for sure. us. But it's also a big game for, you know, for our kids locally. Uh, you know, it's just a, it's a fun game. And we, we try to treat it that way. We try to treat it as, like I always say, it's the best practice we have leading into our season because we have to execute so well against them and and people remember when we play them close I mean we've been playing every year there's a lot of years where it has you know there's sometimes it can get away from us because they are so good I and mean, it's so athletic and so much longer and quicker than we are but you know when we when we do our thing you know something every once in a while you know we catch it and this year it was it was probably one of the closer games down to the wire I know it helps them out as well it, it, it right. gives them a challenge to, to start their season right final 30 seconds for you give me in about 30 seconds, what you tell recruits, how do you sell them on this program? What is your selling point about CBU basketball? Well, a couple of things. Number one, you know, we recruit guys that fit our system. You know, and they, at CBU, they have to be good students. So almost everybody we get has academic money as part of their scholarship. So we recruit guys and they have to fit our style. They have to, you know, they have to be guys that are skilled. You know, our, in, our inside guys have to be able to step out and shoot it. So we sell them on that. And we sell them on Memphis, you know, compared to a lot of the places where we play in Division II, uh, you know, it's, it's great that we have, they, they have the option. Our guys go to Grizzly games. Our guys go to Tiger games mm -hmm. uh, when they have free nights and stuff. So it's, it's, there's a lot more going on. I mean, you know, in some ways it's, it can be a negative a little bit because we do kind of fall, you know, we kind of fall off the radar. Some of the places we go, they, when we go to Huntsville, Huntsville is the team in Huntsville. And they're, you know, so everybody in Huntsville knows what they're doing. But so, you know, that part of it always doesn't help, but, 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 there's a would, lot of other things to I do, but you guys, know what, you're, you're, you're selling them. I tell the guys, I'd rather be, you know, there's three, 13 nights a year where it's kind of nice to be in a smaller town when you're a small program. Right. But the other th 350 days a year, I'm glad I'm in Memphis. <laughs> Mike, continue success. Right. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate it.
And CBU wraps up the regular season tomorrow with a home tilt versus West Florida. Then it's off to the Gulf South Conference Tournament. And that'll do it for this week's show. Next week, we visit with Carolina Panthers and former Memphis Tigers great D'Angelo Williams. And here's a couple of other programming notes for you. In three weeks, Sports Files moves to Thursdays at 8.30 p.m. Check us out in our new time slot. And for the next three Saturdays, you can catch the TSSAA Basketball Championships right here on WKNO. Go to WKNO.org for more information. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.